Hi, everyone. Hope, hope everyone is doing, uh, doing well. Um, thanks for uh, coming out to this uh, first uh, event of the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy News Hour, which is a, uh, a new initiative in terms that I'm thinking about planning to have as a, um, a long term uh, forum to discuss news developments in Canadian foreign policy. Um, and basically this thing comes out of, uh, I recently did a World Beyond War uh, book club about my latest book, a Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military. And um, out of that, we some people wanted to continue the discussion uh, about the book and just about Canadian militariz militarism in general. And so um, I started thinking that maybe it's not a bad idea to have a, a regular kind of discussion forums, uh, updates, news analysis, questions, comments, criticisms uh, about uh, what's going on in Canadian foreign policy, about you know, things I write and or don't write about, uh, uh, et cetera, um, because <clears throat> in part, um, you know, I do a lot of writing about Canadian foreign policy. I've published 10 books and uh, about Canadian foreign policy and hundreds of articles. And not necessarily everyone is as keen about reading as, uh, as listening to, uh, to discussions and, uh, you know, back and forths. So I figured it makes sense to, to you know, move towards a bit more of um, a speaking kind of uh, uh, format uh, for people. Uh, over time, I hope to turn this into a platform for not only, um, you know, me starting off with discussion, but also having a, um, some guests on uh, to delve into some issues in a more in-depth manner. Also, potentially somewhere down the road, having uh, debates, right? Not necessarily always having people that come from uh, the similar kind of uh, uh, perspective, uh, but having having uh, you know debates about different elements of Canadian uh, foreign policy. And and if anyone has ideas about uh, subjects that they would like to have uh, a session uh, dealt with. Um, please send them along. I actually got one today from somebody uh, in Uruguay uh, saying they want a, a discussion about uh, uh, Canadian policy towards uh, uh, Latin America. Um, so if there's any, you know, specific subject areas that you'd like to see a future uh, 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 news hour deal with, uh, please do send that to me. Um, and also if there's, you know, individuals that make sense to, uh, to have on to, uh, to, um, you know, interview to even debate, uh, uh, also send any of those kind of ideas, uh, along. So, and, and I also, in, in each of these, I want to leave a lot of time open for, you know, uh, comments, questions, criticisms. Um, but, uh, to start off, I thought I would start off with a, um, uh, just a discussion about a few things that are in the news that are, I think, pertinent around Canadian foreign policy that I've uh, been paying attention to uh, that, that people should really be uh, uh, talking about. Obviously, the, the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, you know, drags on uh, all kinds of horrible, uh, uh, you know, atrocities taking place as they, as they do in general, in wars, uh, what Russia has done is clear a uh, violation of the UN Charter. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there's also a you know a whole bunch of context that is largely ignored from the dominant uh, by the dominant media. And I'm of the view that Canada has pursued all kinds of policies uh, that have you know escalated tensions uh, on the issue that partly explain don't legitimate, but partly explain the, the, um, the uh, act, act of uh, war that, that Russia has, uh, has precipitated or has launched. 
and you know, I don't, I'm not going to get into all those details because that's a whole discussion uh, in, and of, in and of itself. Uh, but basically, you have Canada expanding NATO eastward. You you have uh, Canada being uh, a fine with Americans ripping up the the INF treaty, the anti ballistic missile treaty, and 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 other uh, um, uh, nuclear disarmament initiatives. And most importantly, you have Canada helping in the overthrow of the uh, elected president in 2014. And then that led, of course, to war in the east of Ukraine. And then, and then Canada then ramped it up with its Operation Unifier and, and basically worked to undermine uh, a peace agreement, uh, uh, w- w- uh, you know, the Minsk Accord peace agreements to end the conflict in eastern Ukraine. So Canada has pr- pursued very you know, uh, belligerent uh, uh, policies in the Ukraine, uh, escalatory policies, policies that the, the, it was clear the Russian government uh, was very uh, hostile to. Uh, and that's you know, some of the background to, to uh, understanding what's, what's going on today. But, but what's going on today with the Canadian government's policy is, is, is remarkable. I mean, they, they have been pursuing you know, escalatory policies with regards to Ukraine and conflict with Russia, you know, depends on when you want to start, start the clock, uh, uh, certainly since 2014, possibly since, you know, 1991 with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and that, that policy, you know, continues right up until today, where you have uh, Melanie Jolie last week, uh, I guess a week Monday, a week today, uh, telling the CBC explicitly, now is not the time for negotiations. Right. That, that's a position that she, you know, two weeks into Russian, Russia's invasion, she said a, a variation of that as well. Now is not the time for negotiations. If you go before February 24th, the Canadian policy was effectively now is not the time for negotiations. Um, so they, they've been really escalating. And then obviously the most important part of the escalation in recent days and, 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 and uh, months is the huge amount of weapons that Canada is, uh, is uh, shipping into, uh, into um, uh, Ukraine. I don't know if people saw uh, today on the front page of the Global Mail, there's a story about basically boasting that the Canadian weapons helped uh, uh, destroy the advanced uh, uh, Russian tank that's the front page is a sort of like boast about Canada, Canadian weapons having played this important role in, in blowing up a, a Russian tank. Um, so, so it, it, you know, it's this continuation of this escalatory policy. Uh, you have uh, a couple of days ago, they announced Canadian general and some more troops being deployed to Latvia. You obviously have, uh, I think it's now up to about 700 Canadian troops in Latvia that have been there for uh, about five years now. They just keep growing uh, the presence. Uh, NATO, of course, is you know uh, stationing more and more troops all around, um, all around uh, uh, Russia's uh, borders, and uh, that's of course you know viewed as as hostile, and it's you know part of this whole escalatory uh, dynamic that we need to move away from. Right, contrary to what uh, Melanie Jolie is saying. We need to be moving towards negotiations. You know, when the Secretary of State of the UN went to Kiev and Moscow, I guess ten days ago, two weeks ago, um, you know, the Canadian government should have been supporting that. They should have been pushing for the, the Secretary General to go earlier. Uh, I didn't see any statement in any way supporting uh, 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 that move by the Secretary General. And incredibly, incredibly, the NDP has now come out publicly basically saying they oppose negotiations. In last week's, Monday, last Monday's Hill Times, uh, Heather McPherson is strongly suggests, it's, it's, it's not a direct quote, it's their summary of what she said, uh, that, that, they, that the NDP doesn't believe now is the time for negotiations. And Charlie Angus uh, was asked on Twitter, another NDP MP, Heather McPherson's the foreign affairs critic, so she's you know, the official voice of the party, um, but Charlie Angus on Twitter was asked, you know, should we send more weapons or should we push for negotiations? And Charlie Angus says we, there should be no negotiations until all Russian troops are out of the country and, uh, and Putin is brought to an international uh, criminal tribunal, which is just another way of saying escalate, prolong the war. And quite frankly, a decent chance that we would move towards 
nuclear war. If that's if that if we can take that kind of maximalist position of all Russian troops out of Ukraine and and the Russian leadership uh, uh, brought to some form of international international criminal court or other form of international tribunal, there, it's very plausible that they will they would respond with you know with uh, with uh, nuclear weapons. So. That's uh, 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 obviously the I think the top the top item that that anti-war anti-war activists in this country should be focusing on is is how do we press the Canadian government to stop the escalation and move towards negotiations to support initiatives uh, uh, that are being pursued internationally uh, uh, for uh, negotiations. Shifting gears to a different part of the world. Some of you may have noticed or seen some reports. There, there, last week, there have been now a few reports in the corporate media, but there hadn't been until uh, about uh, four or five days ago that there are eight miners uh, stuck 550 meters uh, below ground at a Canadian-run mine in uh, Burkina Faso. And it's a, uh, uh, um, on Twitter that a, um, a Diallo, I don't know his first name, but his Twitter profile is Diallo, a, a Pan-Africanist uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, tweeter, um, uh, uh, sort of brought the issue to, uh, to uh, uh, public attention, pointing out how they've been basically stuck underground for more than three weeks. There's almost no international discussion uh, about this fact. Obviously, it's a big story in Burkina Faso. It's a story in, in, in other countries in West Africa. But here it's a Vancouver uh, Trevally mining uh, that that's, uh, the miners are stuck underground and there's almost no attention and pointing out the kind of the races, the racism that went into the sort of, you know, lack of uh, international solidarity. There's other, you know, when the Chilean miners were stuck, uh, I guess, a uh, couple of years ago now that got a lot of attention. There's other examples where miners are stuck under under deep underground and, and that gets international attention. And there was no attention uh, uh, to this. And 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 I think it, it's important this this issue, you know, obviously it's a it's a you know terrible for those individuals stuck underground and their families and 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 uh, their loved ones and, and communities, whatnot. Um, but but it's also I think a, a, it should be a moment to, to discuss one a, a very important element of Canadian foreign policy that gets limited attention, which is the role of Canadian mining around the world, but particularly in Africa. Uh, there are uh, many countries in Africa where Canadian mining is the is the um, uh, the, the advancing the the profits to be extracted from mining is the primary objective of Canadian policy in that country, Burkina Faso being at the top of the list. Canadian companies have something like four billion invested in Burkina Faso, uh, uh, mining companies, that's, their, that's the country's biggest export, uh, gold Canadian companies, I think it's two, uh, three quarters of gold exports, it's Canadian companies uh, responsible for that in, in Burkina Faso. And and Canadian companies, uh, when we talk about Canadian companies, it, you know, the, the, the state and the companies are, you know, deeply enmeshed, right? Canada, you know, even those numbers I just mentioned about how a big a presence Canadian mine, mining companies have in Burkina Faso is actually from a project which the Canadian embassy um, uh, instigated to basically laud the importance of Canadian mining in Africa, so in, in Burkina Faso, to promote the industry. And so they, they instigated this, this uh, uh, initiative with the Ministry of Mines in Burkina Faso. And uh, Canada helped, has been helped in you know, uh, scouring Burkina Faso's uh, territory for uh, uh, resources. There's a uh, Canadian mining school uh, that was set up uh, in 2015 in the country. Uh, Canadian diplomats work with the government, uh, heavily involved in the government uh, uh, in terms of advancing mining. There's projects between Canadian aid uh, uh, agency and, and mining, Canadian mining comes operating in Burkina Faso, uh, on and on and on. Um, 
so so the Canadian government really does a lot to advance the interests of Canadian mining companies uh, in Africa, particularly around the world, Latin America as well, but particularly in Africa, where um, they had, you know, the, the power imbalance is particularly stark, where the, a lot of the countries are, you know, pretty, pretty weak in terms of their their own uh, power and their ability to to um, to resist uh, uh, foreign um uh, influence, meddling, foreign uh, de determination of of mining policy, uh, uh, etc., and and that this 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 is rooted in a, in a like a long history, right? You know, for since the the, the mid to late eighties, Canada has been pushing structural adjustment programs in African countries via the International Monetary Fund, which have opened up African countries' minerals to foreign companies, right? There was very limited Canadian mining investment. Uh, before 1989, and then it explodes uh, uh, across the continent. And you know, we hear a lot about how Chinese companies are buying up uh, African resources, but on a per capita basis, uh, Canadian companies have have a far far higher proportion of, of African uh, resources than than Chinese companies ha uh, uh, Chinese companies have. Um, so the, the issue of, of Canadian mining, and actually uh, just uh, two days ago, there's the big uh, mining conference, the mining in, 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 um, in Daba in South Africa, the biggest uh, African-based um, uh, mining conference. And, uh, you know, while there are uh, miners under, eight miners underground in Burkina Faso, Canadian officials were at the conference in South Africa promoting Canada's mining industry. And, and a number of people pointed out the sort of, how that's kind of a bad look. Uh, we're indifferent to the, you know, eight miners uh, stuck underground, but we, our government keeps pushing uh, the mining interests uh, um, on the continent. And <clears throat> as most of you probably know, Canadian mining companies have been responsible for human rights violations, uh, ecological damage, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, conflicts with local communities, all across the continent and, and around the world. Um, so the question of Canadian mining in Africa is something that I, I wanted to bring up because it has been in the news a little bit and it, it certainly should be in the news a lot more. The final uh, uh, subject I wanted to bring up before I, hearing people's questions, comments, uh, or criticisms is uh, on the question of Palestine. And obviously that's been in the news with the uh, uh, Israel's recent murder of a, a Al Jazeera journalist and then all the, the, uh, the appalling uh, uh, behavior of Israeli police uh, at the funeral, before the funeral, the family's home, uh, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the question of Palestine in Canadian foreign policy is, is one subject that it, there's sort of developments happening kind of almost every day or, or every week. There's, there's uh, you know, it's a whole subject in and of itself. And of course, there's a long history of Canada's role in, in enabling Palestinian dispossession. I, I dealt with some of that history in my 2010 book, uh, 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 Canada and Israel Building Apartheid, which goes through the history of, of Canada's support for Zionism. Um, and that just, you know, that plays out in a, in a, in a day to day uh, uh, basis. One of the things that's interesting about the uh, recent developments is that the liberals have been under pressure, the, you know, very staunchly anti Palestinian uh, Trudeau government has been under pressure. Uh, and even Melanie Julie put out a statement uh, about, you know, the attack on the funeral and the, you know, the Israeli police like beating the pallbearers and, and all kinds of things that you just, you just sort of wonder like what the, you know, what the, quite frankly, the, you know, what were they thinking? How, like, how stupid could you be? It just doesn't seem to make any sense from a public relations standpoint, from Israel's standpoint, except, except if you stick to the logic of just, you know, we are, we are, we are boss and we are going to, we're going to teach the, teach the, uh, the colonized uh, that, you know, we can do whatever we want to do and how dare they have a Palestinian flag uh, <laughs> at the, uh, at the funeral. Um, but, uh, but the so the, the liberals have been under some pressure. Uh, you had a liberal MP a couple of days ago in the House of Commons referring to Israel's apartheid state. Um, uh, the NDP, interestingly enough, has been um, uh, getting a lot better, a lot, lot better on Palestine, basically since that uh, 
completely inglorious interview that that uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh did just before the NDP convention, I think in in April of last year, where he uh, he was asked about Palestine and resolutions being brought to the NDP convention with Palestine, and all he talked about was anti-Semitism, and the uh, CBC, the current. Uh, 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 interviewer pressed him on and just he just <laughs> instead of talking about Palestinians just kept talking about anti-Semitism that in initiated quite an outburst uh, of of uh, rage from the NDP base and and that kind of I think spiraled into a whole series of very positive uh, developments within the within the party including of course the uh, the Palestine resolution being passed at the convention and Heather McPherson the foreign critic. Uh, has been really raising the issue more and more, pressing Melanie Jolie on on Amnesty International's uh, report uh, finding uh, uh, Israel committing the crime of apartheid, and of course Melanie Jolie has no has no response really. Um, uh, so there so there's been some uh, positive. Development. I I'm of the opinion the the cynic in me thinks that part of why the NDP why McPherson is is uh, is taking up the Palestinian issue and not just McPherson but Alexandre Bourlis. And some others more aggressively is um, is they feel they know that there's their policy on Ukraine is really uh, is really hideous, and um, they know that there's a bit of an overlap between those who are uh, pro-Palestinian and uh, some of the sort of anti-war base that's you know quite uh, uh, appalled by their position on on Ukraine, and so it, one you know raising Palestine more and more aggressively deflects a little bit of the anger that may be directed at them on the Ukraine policy. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the case, but I think that that may be a small uh, contributing factor to uh, certainly Heather McPherson taking the issue more, uh, taking the issue up more, more seriously. Um, you know, a couple of developments on the Palestine uh, question, you, you know, the, the Israel lobby launched this attack against uh, uh, Khaled uh, Barakat uh, and uh, the Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network about, uh, I guess it's 10 days, ago now, 10 days ago now, it was on the front page of the National Post. The whole page was a picture of Khaled, uh, who is a Palestinian Canadian out, out, in, out, in, out in Vancouver, uh, who I don't know, but from my understanding is somebody who's been doing, you know, very good uh, 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 political campaigning, uh, not just on Palestine, but involved in other, you know, no one is illegal and other uh, causes. And they're, they're going after him really hard. They've been doing this for a while, uh, but they sort of tried to um, uh, rekindle this campaign, you know, attack Jerusalem Post, front page of the National Post uh, on two, di two different occasions. Um, and they're trying to get the uh, federal government to list uh, Sami Dun as a, as a terrorist organization. And, and it's interesting, the whole process of the terrorist list is quite a fascinating one, where basically or part of how it works is that, so they're trying to say that Sami Dun is a terrorist group because it's associated with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. So the Israel lobby presses for a group to be put on the terrorist list and then claims some other group has an association with that group and therefore should be put on the terrorist list and, and it's a whole process of basically criminalizing all of Palestinian, or most of Palestinian political life. And uh, IRFAN, the International Relief Fund of the Afflicted and Needy, was the first Canadian-based group uh, uh, listed on Canada's ter terrorist list back in 2014. They were listed because they were supporting orphans and a hospital in Gaza through official channels. Official channels in Gaza meant Hamas is in charge, right? So, so you were putting money to the post office that was under Hamas's administration and the health ministries under Hamas administration. And so then they were listed as a terrorist group because they were supposedly helping Hamas when in fact they're helping orphans and, 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 uh, and uh, a hospital. Um, and so some, a similar kind of dynamic is that they're trying to pull that off with, with Sami Dun. Uh, uh, today, but I think there's a there's actually a kind of a um, a bit of a pushback that um, the liberal government is actually uh, uh, you know is ignoring them so far the Israel lobby's campaign so far and it's it's an aggressive campaign so I'm I'm very um, I'm very um, uh, heartened I, I believe that they're they're actually going to fail on, on this uh, effort to uh, to list uh, Sami Dun as a terrorist group and to uh, they actually want to deport. Uh, uh, Khalid, who I understand, I believe, is actually a Canadian citizen. Um, the other issue uh, uh, that is a positive development was just, uh, I guess, uh, 
a day or two ago now, um, the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, uh, found after a five-year legal battle that product of Israel labels on uh, wines that were produced in illegal settlements, that that's, um, that's not allowed, that that doesn't offer the consumers you know, proper knowledge of where the product's coming from and if they don't want to consume uh, wines from illegal Israeli settlements, that you know, they, they should have the right to not consume them. Um, and so that's a five-year legal battle that David Kattenberg and Dimitri Lascaris have been have been waging, and uh, and they now have uh, not a complete, not a hundred percent victory. Uh, obviously, you know the whole idea there's even wines from settlement uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank being allowed to come into Canada is an outrage. Uh, obviously, we don't just want proper labeling; we want we want you know an end to that even taking place, and certainly an end to the the uh, Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement uh, enabling those products to come into this, this country without, uh, without tariffs. Um, but, 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 you know, I think they, but nonetheless, this, this recent uh, victory is a, is a small victory that we should, uh, we should be happy with. And then finally, on a, another, I think, positive note is the, uh, over the weekend here in Montreal, there was uh, more than a thousand people demonstrating for the Nakba, Nakba protest, the, you know, Palestinian catastrophe. Canada, of course, played an important role in the Nakba, and if people want, I can get into that either uh, later today or in some future session. Um, but uh, but there was a you know, major protest in Montreal. I think there were even bigger demonstrations in Toronto, and there were there was uh, protests across the country. I'm not sure exactly how many, but I think towards a dozen or more cities had uh, significant uh, uh, demonstrations, and and uh, so that's a. You know, the, there there is a groundswell of uh, of uh, activism on Palestine. Unfortunately, there's not a groundswell of activism on on a lot of the anti-war issues. But there is that it, Palestine is one issue where there is you know real um, uh, uh, organized uh, solidarity activism taking place, and it's certainly something that that we should support. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if people have questions, comments, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm just getting this tech all down. So I think that you can just um, uh, ask your questions. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself, I believe. Uh, and if anyone has questions or comments, you can uh, maybe put your hand up or you can uh, just ask your question. And if people want, if, if for whatever reason, people prefer to put questions in the chat, uh, um, then, you know, go ahead and, uh, and you can write your question and, uh, yeah. And I, like I said, I also, I'm also, you know, totally keen on criticisms or, 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 uh, or disagreements that, um, <clears throat> people may have. Go ahead, Sally. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. It is so incredibly. Um, I think you might still be muted. Oh, I. Bianca, I, Bianca. Well, now she's oh, muted. I can't hear. Now Sally. Sally, muted. Sally is. Yeah, oh, Sally's good to go. I can hear you now. Sorry, I, my my. You well, can hear me. I can't hear. Okay. You. First of all, thanks so much. It's so great to have a Canadian perspective. Oh. We can actually have a chance to make a difference with our in our own country. Um, I just wanted to say another positive development may be the four major universities who've come out in support of BDS. Um, I know UBC, UVic, McGill, and I'm not sure about the last one, but that's positive. The other thing I wanted to ask was um, on the on the um, attack on Khaled Bakarat. I'm wondering if you think it might be helpful to contact Terry Glavin. He's a, you know, he's a well-known writer. He's the one who wrote that letter in the Toronto Star. And he was given the information by the lobby, right, about Khaled Baccarat. And, he, you know, he's written books like Death Beast and Dim Lahamad. He's aware of Indigenous issues. And I was just wondering what you think oh, about right writing the author directly to see uh, to challenge him on that and see if he himself might issue um, some kind of revised um, you know analysis of, of uh, Baccarat's terrorism Barakat's so-called you know terrorism well I, I can say that I, I have been I, I, I have actually been in touch with Terry Glavin on uh, Twitter 
and I, I criticized him about what he'd written. And I, I posted about how I'm actually, I didn't even know this previously. Uh, that, that, um, that, uh, sorry, um, just going to get these tech tech issues down, but that, um, I was, I'm actually, I didn't know this prior to the recent attacks against him, but I'm actually scheduled to speak with Barakat at an uh, event uh, on the CANSEC in, uh, in Ottawa in early June against the CANSEC, the big arms uh, fair. And Glavin's, I mean, his response is, there, there's no response. He just, he just, the Israeli, I mean, he says clearly that, that CIJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, provide him all this detail, this dossier on, on, uh, on Barakat. And, uh, and that, you know, comes from the Israeli intelligence agencies. And he just basically believes what the Israeli government is saying. And, you know, so Terry Glavin is someone, I know he has this left-wing history and I know my father, um, uh, you know, uh, knew him back in the day and, and, and that stuff. But I mean, it's, it's quite a while now where he's become a, a, a extreme um, hawk or imperialist, if you like, on international issues. He still publishes, you know, maybe six months, a year ago, maybe it's a bit longer than that, he still publishes a rare kind of like pro working class kind of, he did it, there was a strike, he wrote, a, you know, he wrote, he did it quite a, for the National Post and for Post Media, it was a very good like sort of pro, pro union kind of uh, article. Um, but on international issues, it's, you know, Russia, China, Iran are, you know, they are the root of all evil and the, the you know, Washington, Ottawa and London are the root of all, uh, all uh, righteousness. Does anyone else have, I'm trying to see if I got this better uh, view here. I don't know if I get to see, I'm seeing everyone. Does anyone else have any uh, uh, comment or uh, question or? <clears throat> this is Dwyer Sullivan. My, all my comments, uh, Eve, are around Palestine and the um, disappointment of Western media and everything is so pro-Israel and every day, every week, every month, it gets worse. And uh, the irony, of course, of bragging about Ukraine's resistance and of course vilifying Palestinians throwing stones is just becomes more obvious that, you know, it's really the United States against Russia. And uh, that's my view. And Anyway, I just stop. I just I don't know what else to say. Everything is so uh, distorted in my view that uh, we can't. How do you vilify Palestine and create and you know uh, praise Ukraine for resisting? Anyway, just your comment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's all these people. <clears throat> just today, I had I was in this debate um, with these people from like the Norman Patterson School. And they're all talking about how <clears throat> this is, you know, violation of, of the international rules order of, you know, taking land by force. And I'm like, uh, have you heard of the Golden Heights? <laughs> have you heard of, you know, the West? I mean, it's just, but but uh, it's just doesn't get it doesn't get framed in that way in our media. And I, and I think it is point you, you said, you know, I think Canada is that we should understand Canada being at war with Russia in, in NATO. Like there, right. they, there's so many ways. I mean, it's maybe not a full, full scale war, but in 2011, when Canada was bombing uh, Libya, that wasn't a full scale war either, but we consider that rightly a war, you know, mostly from the sky, there was special forces on the ground, but there's so many hundreds of former Canadian troops, including people who were like top generals, uh, the one on April 5th, he leaves the Canadian military and he's immediately in, in Ukraine to act like that's just like, you know, your top Canadian general one day and you're in the Ukraine the next day and that there's nothing to do with Canada. I mean, that's hard to uh, uh, take seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, our media, they, while we don't officially say, hey, we're at war, the whole media environment in this country 
is of one that that there is you know so little room for um, uh, uh, dissent or, or or hey, there's more context here. And Patrick Brown to, to point out one thing on the Palestine question is kind of interesting. Patrick Brown for the uh, running to lead the Conservative Party, um, he pointed out uh, uh, some variation of that in an interview uh, by an Arab paper here in Montreal, where he was asked about, uh, you know, uh, uh, refugees uh, and um, well, a couple parts. And he was asked about refugees from places like Yemen, Syria. Uh, I, I don't know if Palestine was part of that question versus refugees from, from Ukraine. He pointed out the double standard of how, how they're treated. But then he also said uh, something in that direction with regards to uh, you know contrasting how how we how we view uh, Ukraine and and the Palestine, and he of course was attacked from the uh, the pro-Israel groups for 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 doing that, and he, you know that him doing that is part of his um, electoral strategy that's oriented around. Um, reaching out with a with a with sort of like um, immigrant communities and uh, you know communities of, of color in in um, in I think particularly in the Toronto area, uh, but also in, in you know Vancouver and Montreal. So he actually sees somewhat of an electoral strategy. Interestingly enough, um, that I guess there's you know uh, parts of the you know Arab or Palestinian communities that are kind of sort of fairly fairly conservative leaning. On many issues, uh, fairly right wing, but then they're you know fairly sympathetic to Palestinian rights or, or you know, concerned about Yemen or or and and so he sees um, a somewhat of a electoral strategy even within the Conservative Party uh, mm -hmm. to to do that, which I think is a somewhat uplifting kind of a, a point. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, thanks, Eve. Um, I just wanted to give you a great big thank you, thank you for standing up to Melanie Jolie um, at that, was it a breakfast? I'm not quite sure where it was, where you said no to NATO, no to war. Um, I was so proud of you. Thank you so much for what you did there. Thanks, thanks. It's something, it's actually a subject, the whole subject of, of how to and, and why we should uh, disrupt uh, uh, ministers is a subject that I think in a future uh, uh, session might be worth dealing with. Because we actually had, before the pandemic, we had something called Disruption Network Canada, where we, had, we disrupted, uh, well, many dozens uh, of uh, liberal ministers, uh, different politicians in the lead up to... Um, to uh, the 2019 election, obviously the pandemic made that a lot more difficult. Um, but it's actually remarkably easy. That was like uh, that. That disruption was like uh, about a minute. I was in the hotel in total for about two minutes, um, and uh, I actually got the hotel wrong. I went to the wrong hotel. It was like a block and a half over. I thought it was actually having a different hotel. <laughs> And then, and then uh, I was like in the room for about 45 seconds. So it took me 25 minutes to walk across the city or, or part of downtown uh, there and back each time. But, but besides that, the whole thing took maybe, I guess, an hour. And, you know, it led to um, uh, quite a wide uh, 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 circulation. Obviously, most disruptions don't get that kind of that kind of circulation, but there's, you know, when there are cameras around and when there are uh, politicians to have a little sign that says uh, no to NATO, to have a sign that says uh, free Palestine, to have a sign that says um, uh, Israel's apartheid state, to have a sign saying uh, uh, end, uh, you know, end Canadian mining abuses uh, um, and, and, you know, and, making a you know a simple statement um it can have quite a bit of a political impact it, it it's uh, you know it, it's not it's not a substitute for building mass movements with with uh you know people a thousand people on the street or you know major demonstrations and all that kind of stuff but it, it i think it is a is a way um uh, that can be uh you know a way in a context right now where there isn't that much international solidarity activism to you know break through into the mainstream and the corporate media to uh make life a little bit more difficult for the politicians 
and also to to um, to galvanize our side, right? We, we like it, the, the, in the case of Ukraine specifically, the media is so one sided that to like you know poke through a little bit and say, hey, there's there's you know we're not all in agreement that 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 you know uh, Canada is so righteous in in its policy in in, in Ukraine. Um, so. Any other questions, comments? I, I unfortunately, with my uh, gallery view, I'm not sure if I'm seeing everyone. So I'm not uh, sure. I'm, I'm here. It's Laurel, Laurel Thompson. I'm just wondering where, where, where's Nikki Ashton on on the um, the NDP uh, adopting such a conservative pro-liberal, pro-government policy about Ukraine and, and, and Palestine? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't think she's anywhere. I think she's just staying quiet. Um, okay. if, if, you, if you look just before uh, the Russian invasion, there was uh, Leah Gazan uh, put out a tweet that was good for, for the political climate, was, was quite good. I, I, I don't think you know, I would have quibbled with some of the wording. I don't think there was, she could have worded or she could have protected herself a bit better with some of her wording, but basically I think was, you know, going in the right direction. Don Davies, uh, uh, a Vancouver MP, he, um, he tweeted uh, an article from antiwar.com that was, you know, sort of an article, critical kind of, you know, good article going in the right direction. And Leah particularly, but Don, is, Don Davies as well, got, it was a vicious backlash. Right. Uh, um, and uh, I think that's, you know, that was designed uh, and it was succeeded in really scaring, put, put Leah Gazan on the back foot and put the other MPs, be it Nikki Ashton, be it uh, Matthew Green. I don't know exactly where, you know, where <coughs> Matthew Green is in his personal views on the issue, but I would presume that at least Nikki Ashton is understands there's a lot more to what's going on in the Ukraine than, than, than we're being told in the major media. Uh, and I probably, probably uh, Matthew Green is of that opinion and maybe a few, Alexandre Boris might be of that opinion, a few other MPs. Um, but they're of course just, you know, they, they, they're totally scared. They're, they, they, they see no margin. They see no electoral margin for, for uh, raising the issue. And they, you know, they fear, uh, they fear a uh, you know an onslaught, uh, and 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 I'm sure I'm sure that uh, Jimmy Singh and Heather McPherson have made it clear to the rest of the caucus that this is not you know stay quiet and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I mean I I think uh, you know, get back to the whole disruption thing. I you know I uh, uh, Singh was in Montreal uh, ten days two weeks ago. I found out about early in the morning through the Hill Times that he was here doing a press conference with Alexandre Boris. Um, and I actually, I, I scoured the, online. I had about 45 minutes to try to figure out where, where it was. I couldn't find out where the actual press conference was and I was planning on going and, and really challenging them on um, their support for the federal budget that, that put half a billion dollars in, in, um, in weapons to uh, Ukraine, as well as not just the, to the Ukraine, but the, the increase in the military budget, right? Like this business about $8 billion increase in the Canadian military budget, that, that, it mis it's very misleading in terms of what that really means. That's, for, that's forever, every year going forward, $8 billion more every year forever. And that's already on top of the 70% increase that the Liberals have been building since announcing you know, in 2017, with a strong, secure, engage. So I, I don't remember the exact numbers. I don't have them right in front of me, but it's like in 2016, Canadian military spending was about 19 billion, and and by 2026, it's supposed to be I think, uh, is it 32 billion? Um, no, so it was supposed to be 32 billion, and then there's 8 billion on top of that. So now it's supposed to be 40 billion. I think that's that. I think that's the number. I, I, I don't unfortunately have it right in front of me, but that doesn't even account for Veterans Affairs, right? Veterans Affairs is a whole other budget <coughs> line. It's not Department of National Defense. And then you can actually go into other elements of the of the federal government that are certainly billions of dollars more that in one way or another actually ultimately are you know really part of the military as well. 
So, you know, this is just huge sums of money and the, and the NDP, you know, completely, uh, you know, supported it. Uh, uh, again, they supported the, the arms shipments, the, and, and, and this, this business of putting in a federal budget half a billion dollars in weapons to a country. I, I can't say this for sure, but I think this is unprecedented in, in yeah. Canadian history. Yeah. You know, there's a history of, if you go back and through NATO and the 1950s of Canada providing weapons to the huge amounts, huge amounts, billions and billions of those weapons in today's money, billions of dollars of weapons to uh, French, uh, Belgians, British, uh, 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 Portuguese, while they were, you know, repressing the, the you know, Mau Mau revolt in Kenya or the independence movement in Algeria or Vietnam or, or you know, elsewhere. Um, so there's, this isn't the first time that, you know, Canada's given weapons, as they did in the 50s through NATO, given weapons to, you know, fight wars that are, you know, in case of Ukraine, it's actually much more legitimate wars than 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 the than the uh, the 1950s, the colon anti-colonial or the pro-colonial wars. But but um, uh, nonetheless, I don't actually have it in a budget line in the you know in the but in the budget. I don't think that's uh, that's ever been done before, and it kind of speaks to just sort of the extent to which our whole political culture is kind of whipped into a, a frenzy on on. On Ukraine and and on and on um, you know targeting uh, uh, Russia, right? So so does it? I mean, does it make sense to sort of talk to those those sort of um, less less conventional NDP people like Ashton and Davies and Bulleries, or does it make sense to devote or maybe do both? But but you know devote to uh, you know citizen citizen anti war movement is probably the best. Is, is, is to be out there just pushing against this whole thing. Yeah, I think that I think being out there and pushing against the whole thing is what's 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 necessary. Uh, I, I don't I wouldn't I think we should be certainly talking to uh, Leah Gazan. And I know I know people that people in the Winnipeg Peace Alliance, including um, uh, people like Glenn uh, Miklachuk, who's you know of Ukrainian background, is part of uh, the Progressive Ukrainian organization, uh, who don't don't agree don't agree with this you know the the U Ukrainian Canadian Congress and their sort of you know pro NATO pro pro um, like fight Russia kind of kind of perspective. Um, they've been in touch with Leah Gazan for a long time, right? Just there, you know, there's been long, lots of co communication between the Winnipeg Peace Alliance, which is one of the few. Uh, Peace, peace alliance groups that have sort of continued since the Iraq war, right? The you know, big network that was set up with the Iraq war and they've, they've continued on. So they're definitely uh, in touch with Leah Gazan. And, and again, I don't think it's the, it's not, the problem is not what's in, what's in like someone like Leah Gazan's head or, or I don't, not as, not as sure with Nikki Ashton, but I presume with Nia, Nikki Ashton, it's not, it's not a concern about what's in her head. It's a concern about the, the political climate that just doesn't allow for, uh, you know, moving very far on this issue at the moment. You know, if you go back and you look historically, you know, World War One. I, I mean, the, with the exception of Quebec, and Quebec was a whole different story. But the English Canadian left completely supported World War One, right? And you, the you Labour papers. I've, I've quoted this in my my book, Left Right Marching to the Beat of Imperial Canada. You know, they were they were over the top. Right? They were over the top. Like, we got to go to war. This is the greatest thing. This is a fight for freedom and all this kind of stuff. It makes the current climate seem, you know, pretty open for for debate and discussion. Right? I mean, people were being thrown in jail for for oppo <laughs> opposing the war. Um, you know, but that did change. Right? That changed in the case of World War One. It changed in large part because of conscription, uh, but it also changed with time. So, so, you know, what, what, I, what is a marginal view at one point in a war, um, uh, unf you know, ideally you wouldn't have to take, you know, six months, a year, five years for that, that position to become less marginal or more, you know, more mainstream, but, but um, and all the killing that would come along with that. But, 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 you know, unfortunately, that's usually how it has worked uh, in the history of, uh, of anti-war activism. Um, so, so, you know, we may be of a marginal view right now within the political uh, culture, but, but, you know, if we keep, uh, if we keep raising the issue and keep doing what we can to, to break through, break through the, the one-sided, uh, depiction that, that, you know, that, that position can become, 
uh, far, far less, uh, less marginal. Any other uh, question? Oh, Yuri, I see you have your uh, hand up there. Uh, hey, Eve, actually, before I go to my question, there's a woman called uh, Tina Liakopoulos who, wanted to, who, who had two questions in the very early beginning about uh, Israel in the uh, chat. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Well, why don't, why, why don't you ask your question? I'll, I'll try to go through the chat to see if I can find- Yeah, the, sure. Uh, uh, so m my question is about, uh, first of all, it's, it's great that you're doing this, Eve, and I look forward to trying to tune in as much Mondays as possible to, uh, to listen and, and participate in this. But I have a question about uh, Ukraine, which is, uh, now I've, I've read several of your articles and I completely agree uh, you know, with you on, you know, on, much, on much of what you've written. But uh, what's your response to some on the anti-war, uh, anti-imperialist movement, who say that uh, who, who say that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is completely justified, given you know, you know given the fact that uh, that the West has been trying to provoke Russia, the West has installed a pro-NATO friendly government uh, on its border and that Russia exhausted all of its uh, all of its diplomatic means and therefore Russia it was in uh, Russia was right to have invaded Ukraine what's your uh, response to that because I know you've gone some you know criticism on social media for you know condemning Russia's actions on the Ukraine even though but yeah What's your response? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I think it, it, it's a pretty clear violation of the UN Charter uh, in terms of uh, you know there aren't Ukrainian troops in Russia, um, and and uh, you know would Russia have been uh, have more uh, you know legitimate uh, um, would it have been more legitimate for Russia to have in some way attacked the U.S. I'm not saying necessarily like an invasion, but maybe you know if if the U.S. is 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 uh, is uh, you know instigating a conflict with Russia, which I, I fully believe the U.S. has been doing for for years in, in all kinds of different forms, then then you know why take it out on Ukrainians? Now I understand to some extent why Russia did take it out on Ukrainians, but but I think that that's melded in with the fact that. The Russian government, first of all, Russia has been a long imperial force in its region. Uh, uh, secondly, it's a very militarized country, right? It's you know huge, like four percent of its GDP is spent on the military. It's a big arms exporter. So, so you know, did did the did the Russian government try all possible uh, mechanisms to to uh, undercut? Uh, NATO eastward expansion and the aggressive positions of, of Washington and Ottawa? I, I don't believe they did. I mean, for instance, why, why couldn't Moscow have announced some fund? We're going to put up 20 billion, 50 billion, some huge amount of money to uh, uh, groups in, in Canada, the US, uh, Western Europe, for them to campaign to, uh, to lessen tensions to end NATO expansion, and we feel threatened, and we want, you know, that we need to get back to the nu nuclear nuclear agreements, uh, you know, and and you know, put this out there and say, hey, we're going to try this mechanism of of you know, I don't know, building what you whatever you want to call that. I don't want to call it exactly international solidarity, but it somewhat is international solidarity, and 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 because we we don't want to go to war, we think the worst thing would be to go to war and whatever. But they didn't try that, but because the people who run Russia are not. You know, they're not, I don't think that the people who run Cuba, for instance, or maybe even the people who run Venezuela, and, and I'm not saying that everything is perfect with the people who run Venezuela or Cuba, but I think they, they go way closer in that in the right direction on 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 some of that that kind of stuff. Um, but so so no, I don't I don't believe that the Russian government, you know, tried tried everything. And I, and I think there is a there, you know, I think the Russian government and Russian society at, at some level have a have a um, a paternalistic view towards Ukrainians. I think it's completely blown out of proportion in in our media, and uh, uh, but but I, I think I don't think that you know Moscow is operating based upon 
you know, geostrategic interests that are, you know, obviously right now, I think quite, quite inhumane, <laughs> um, and, and its own kind of, you know, militaristic uh, uh, kind of logic. Um, uh, so I think it's very, I, to be honest, I think it's very unfortunate for people to, um, you know, I, I, I completely agree with the idea that we should be spending our time focusing on how our government is contributing to injustices and contributing to, to empire and contributing to uh, geopolitical tensions. I completely agree with that. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think. I think it's wrong for for uh, you know Canadians, people based in Canada and Canada, speaking to a Canadian audience, you know, organizing political whatever to to spend much time talking about how you know Russia's you know murderous illegal invasion. I think we should say it. And then talk about how the Canadian government is, you know, the ways in which Canadian government is contributing, because that's where we have most control over. So I, I completely uh, agree with that as, you know, front and center of how we we uh, structure our our our, our yes, political organizing and our positions. Um, but but I but I but I but I don't think that. Um, uh, yeah, I think we should be clear that it's a violation of the UN Charter, and and it's you know. There's lots and lots of Ukrainians are being killed. Yeah, I think, and I think you know, just a quick follow up. Uh, uh, yeah, just a quick follow up to say to that. Uh, that actually could be uh, that. That actually could be an interesting you know debate to have in the future. Because I was talking with David Swanson earlier today. I'm going to upload it. Uh, uh, you know, the interview on my YouTube channel about, uh, you know, a debate he had on on whether wars are ever justifiable. And, you know, I completely understand the Russian point of view, and I completely understand where a lot of anti-imperialist thinkers and so forth say when they say, you know, when they condemn, uh, you know, Western actions, which led to Russia being you know, provoked into this, but yeah, Ben, Ben, Hugh, that I think that's I think that would be an interesting you know debate to have in the future on uh, you know on uh, Russia's uh, response. But, but yeah, I completely agree with you that that I think it was sort of that, that I don't think it really helped the Russian case to have invaded Ukraine, even if we do understand it. But yeah, because yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll just I'll I'll leave that. That. Uh, uh, Mark, do you wanna? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna to try to end close to seven because I do. I do want to try to keep these to an hour. I probably should have uh, organized it a little bit better on that front earlier on. But uh, go ahead, Mark, uh, for your comment question. Are you hear me? Okay. Uh, I was thinking uh, about uh, the, the the foreign policy uh, of uh, Pierre Trudeau, uh, Justin's uh, father. Uh, which seemed for uh, quite uh, many years uh, rather independent from uh, the U.S. foreign policy. He took stands uh, for Cuba and he dismantled uh, the, uh, uh, what were they called, the Bomark uh, nuclear missiles and other things. So uh, uh, what happened between uh, the time of Trudeau uh, having this independent uh, stand uh, uh, from the U.S. and his son being so rolling over the U.S. foreign policy. Well, I don't think that Pierre Trudeau had the independent uh, foreign policy that uh, some depict. I mean, I think there's some, you know, what he did on uh, with Cuba, some stuff on Cuba was, was uh, you know, uh, better. Um, if you look at what he did with uh, the overthrow of Augusto uh, of, of Salvador Allende by Augusto Pinochet, he he fully supported the coup uh, even before the coup. If you look at Canada's role in contributing, at, not not as like nothing to the extent of Canada's role in overthrowing the Aristide in two thousand four, or how involved Canada was in trying to get rid of uh, the Venezuelan government more recently, but he but he did. He he was definitively in support of 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 uh, of Pinochet against Allende. Um, if you look at Indonesia's invasion of East Timor and going along with that, uh, if you look at South Africa, even apartheid South Africa, uh, Pierre Trudeau wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't that good. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, Pierre Trudeau, you know, he came to office talking about, uh, you know, reviewing NATO, right? He, there were some moments at different periods where he, he didn't, he didn't move forward with that. Uh, you know, he kept Canadian troops in, in Europe during, during, uh, uh, during that period. Um, and you look at Palestine and Pierre Trudeau on Palestine is kind of interesting. He was, he moved, he definitely moved towards a more pro-Palestinian position from Lester Pearson, who was a, you know, quite a rabid, rabid Zionist Pearson was. Uh, so Pearson, uh, Trudeau moved in, in, a, in a better direction, but, he, you know, still Canada's voting record on Palestinian rights was, was, uh, was uh, very, uh, you know, pro-Israel. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, um, you know, I think on Vietnam, uh, 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 Pierre Trudeau, you know, did some things in the right direction, but Canadian arms sales mostly continued. Uh, so it, it's not, um, you know, that Canada has one. been tied into the two main empires, right? Let's let's be clear here now. This is more than a hundred years. Canada being right at the center of the two great empires of the day: the British, the American, yeah. Canadian elite being uh, tied into the profit making the worldview uh the racism of those of those empires and and uh there are differences right i i think that i think it's you know i think it's correct to say that justin trudeau i i would have expected a little bit less bad from justin trudeau from harper to justin trudeau i would have expected a little bit less bad and in fact in fact we kind of had that with stefan dion right stefan dion yeah. was you know, I, <laughs> let's not exaggerate anything, but Stéphane Dion was clearly better than Christian Freeland in, in, in oh. his, he was trying to, there was an effort to restart diplomatic relations with Iran, even with, with Russia, there was an effort, a bit of reproachment with Russia. Uh, and, and that was, that was, you know, that was kiboshed by, by the, by the, you know, by Trudeau, obviously Trudeau himself, but by the, by Canadian political, you know, power structure, political uh, culture in this country. Um, so, so, uh, you know, there are, there are, there are little different, there are differences within the Liberal Party, and probably even within cabinet today of, of, you know, differing degrees. Uh, I think someone like Christian Friedland does represent the, the more uh, hawkish uh, uh, element. Um, and, um, I don't think Justin Trudeau, you know, I don't think he's, I don't think he cares that much about what's going on in the world. Uh, I don't think he's like a particularly, you know, uh, you know, knowledgeable person on international issues or strong views or, or this kind of stuff. He, he's mostly just going where the, you know, the dominant media, the big corporations, the, the Washington, the, the sort of political uh, uh, zeitgeist on these issues. Go ahead, uh, uh, Nahid. Um, I know we are short in time, but just wondering, these are absolutely valuable uh, sessions. Uh, uh, we learn a lot and thank you very much. I guess the issue is at the end of that uh, one hour, is there a way that uh, we can pick a topic, uh, something that we can develop more advocacy? I mean, we are saying, okay, we, we we don't like this war, but what are we doing? Um, uh, you know, when I learned that actually at the, the world level, we are going to have populations at risk for serious food sh uh, shortage, uh, energy shortage, and all these things. Uh, so at hu humanitarian level, uh, the voices of people who do not support the current uh, government position that it's not time for to negotiate. Uh, so the our voices need to be heard. And if there is a way that we can have a statement uh, or something that either we then we can individually send to our MPs or to uh, newspaper editors. Uh, also, in addition, how we can get you uh, eased in, into some of this big media as a, you know, to be interviewed. You have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, like, 
have forces tvo have have they uh, uh, approached you uh, in in their for their panel on this issue um, just thinking of ideas how we can promote um, and rather than just talking among ourselves well, I mean, I think there's there are many parts on a, on a personal level. I mean, yeah, I, I've you know, twelve years ago, the CBC Current had me on for a short discussion of my Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy, about specific about Canadian mining. So you know, there's small opportunities at different periods to break into the corporate media. Oh, overwhelmingly, it doesn't exist, right? There, there's there's no interest. There's you know, um, it, they know that there are voices putting forward some of these ideas. And if there are, you know, 5,000 people marching in Ottawa, they will have some of the people <laughs> voicing these ideas on CBC The Current. But if there aren't 5,000 people marching, they will just act like those ideas and those voices don't exist. Um, uh, that's, of course, one of the reasons to do the disruptions, right? One of the reasons to do disruptions is it's a small way of breaking through that you know that wall on 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 uh, on international issues, and I should be really clear about that. You know the media is biased towards power on on all all, all different issues, from the minimum wage to indigenous rights. On foreign policy, its magnitude's worse, right? The the the, ra the range of debate is so narrow in the dominant media, right? And 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 that so it's it's really hard to bust through that. Um, but okay, so now I'll get to the question of the activism part. Um, I mean, there are groups, you know, I, I'm part of the uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute uh, that that is trying to have a hub of critical ideas on Canadian foreign policy. We, there's you know some action network things there's webinars there's you know we we don't we haven't organized demonstrations but we've supported demonstrations that are being organized like the nakba demonstrations on the weekend um there's groups like world beyond war there's a, a voice of women for peace there's most most cities do still have some little like anti-war is it a you know a peace alliance the hamilton coalition stop the war winnipeg peace alliance uh, I believe there's a P Ottawa Peace Council. There's the Ottawa Anti-Imperialist Alliance. Uh, uh, there's um, you know there's groups in most cities that are doing you know some. There's obviously Palestine solidarity groups in basically every city. There's uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Independent Jewish voices that are you know national in character. Um, so so there are there are. Um, uh, uh, obviously, world beyond war, more kind of national. Um, there are there are groups do, doing some of this stuff. Uh, you know, concretely, if you have a, um, a Canadian foreign policy issue, let's say, like a you know, you want an action alert, uh, like to send to MPs or to send the Prime Minister on some Canadian foreign policy issue, I think that you know the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute could be open to doing. Uh, to doing that and, 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 you know, email, you can email uh, uh, Bianca to, to uh, you know, if you have an idea or if you create a text and, and you know, that we do have, a, there is a list of 14,000 people on that list and, you know, Just Peace Advocates also has a big list and, and so when, when the action alerts happen, they usually get hundreds and hundreds of emails to the, to the MP or the Prime Minister or whoever the, the target, um, uh, you know, that's only, one part, I think we also have to have street demonstrations, we have to have, you know, other, other, you know, blockades or whatever, other kind of more sort of um, uh, direct kind of a, a, a political action, but, but nonetheless, it's important to, to do on special these international issues that are very marginal to, to at least have action alerts. So, so if, if that, if you have uh, some type of initiative on that front, uh, that could be something to 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 bring forward, but I would also just you know counsel that there are like I said there are different groups and most cities do have some group at a local level, let alone uh, you know some of the world beyond war, some of the Palestine solidarity kind of at a national level uh, to get to get uh, 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 plugged into, um, but yeah. So. If if there if there aren't, I, I, I'm going to get this this tech down better because I only see about 12 people on the screen now, and I know it says there's many more than that there, uh, many more than that here. Um, I'm going to get to figure out how to see everyone and other questions, and I apologize for any questions I didn't 
uh, get to and people have the hand up and stuff like that, but I, I, I can only see what I can see. Um, and I'll, I'll hopefully get that tech element uh, dealt with uh, for next uh, next week. And, and I think with time, I'm going to start making the events uh, uh, thematic. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for coming out and please do share, you know, with people who might be interested in, in the subject, share, um, you know, this, this is happening and, and uh, I, uh, yeah, and if you have ideas of how it would better run, stuff like that, please send me an email um, and I'll take a look at some, I see there's some different stuff in the chat and I'll take a look at uh, all that stuff uh, to see what people are saying there. And again, thanks a lot for uh, for coming and uh, have a good night. Ha and uh, have it on YouTube. Thanks. And I'll post it to YouTube. That's my plan. Okay. Oh, great! Thank you. Thanks. Will we get a Zoom notice for next week, same time? I, I believe so. I believe it's going to have a have a, um, a reminder a notice. Okay, good. All right. Anyway, nice Super. going. Well, Super. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. <laughs>